We got Ron and Sana joining us on the line as well. Frequent CNBC contributor and author of Insana's Market Intelligence. He did not want to miss the opportunity to be on with you, Peter. Ron, how you doing this morning? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Happy New Year to you both. Yeah. Hey, happy New Year, Ron. Happy New Year, Peter. Glad you could join us, Ron. Uh, we're just talking with Peter here, and uh, he's he's uh, could it be more? I want to say against the Fed, but he thinks it's all smoke and mirrors. There's not going to be any raise in interest rates in 2015. And in fact, he's calling for QE4, maybe QE5. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, it, it, that's the one area where Peter and I agree is that I don't necessarily think the Fed's going to be able to raise interest rates in 2015. I mean, I'm operating off the premise still that the U.S. is, is, is the not just the best house in a bad neighborhood, but actually a pretty good house. The, the economy is, is, is doing well and doing better. Uh, growth is accelerating. We're seeing, you know, a, a clear pickup. Residential real estate has been a drag, but, you know, employment's improved. Uh, auto sales, retail sales, GDP are all above uh, pre-2007 uh, peaks. Uh, and so I, I think we're fine. <clears throat> the problem to me is, is the rest of the world and, and deflation risk that exists in Europe, uh, to, to, to a certain extent in China, certainly in Japan. Uh, Russia's in the midst of its own implosion. And so I think that with these offshore risks, the Federal Reserve, with inflation moving lower rather than higher and away from its 2% target, is going to take its time, not just be patient, but ultimately may not have to pull the trigger in, in, in 2015 uh, because they're going to be headwinds hitting us from offshore as opposed to hitting us from onshore, for, uh, is, as is usually the case. Hey, Ron, when you say you're worried about deflation, I mean, are you, are, you, are you worried about asset prices coming down in Europe, like stock prices or real estate prices, or are you worried about consumer prices, like food and energy and stuff like that? Well, both, to, 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 to a certain extent. I mean, in deflation in, in its financial form, um, where we're seeing, you know, to Europe – just had its uh, the smallest stock market gain since uh, sometime in the 1990s. It's not, it wasn't a great year for, for European stocks, by and large. And if you look at the interest rate structure in Europe, where um, even as they're waiting for quantitative easing from the European Central Bank, and, and their next meeting is January 22nd, we have uh, yields on 10-year German bonds at you know a half percent. Japan is at 03 uh, percent. Uh, in, in certain European countries, there are negative interest rates. They're fighting falling pr- prices for uh, both consumer goods and, and to a, but, in, but in Ron, some areas for assets. It, but if you think that European economies are weak, wouldn't falling I consumer guess. prices help out? I mean, if, they, if, if prices went down for gasoline or for food or for clothing or for health care or shelter or everything – wouldn't that strengthen the economy? Because wouldn't it give consumers more purchasing power if their cost of well, living certainly, went down? Well, certainly, I think in the, in the case of gasoline, sure. I mean, and in fact, you know, gasoline is a considerably higher price in Europe than it is in the United States, and it does become a tailwind. Um, but but Europe is not responding to lower interest rates, which also is reducing the cost of capital uh, across the continent. Well, and, and deflation as a Japanese-style phenomenon or a 1930s-style phenomenon seems to me to be more of a risk overseas. They haven't fought it well. Um, I happen to, as, as as Peter well knows, I happen to be a huge fan of the Fed. I think they've done the right things. I think they're dying to raise interest rates and normalize policy. Uh, if, but they I, were dying, they Ron, be, if they were dying to raise rates, they'd have done it years ago. You know. Well, they, no, they, they, why, why would you do it they, years ago in the midst of a recession? I mean, that makes absolutely no sense. I mean, well, wait a minute, I, Ron, according to the Fed, we've been in a recovery for five or six years. In fact, this recovery is now so long in the tooth that statistically we're getting ready for the next recession. Meanwhile, the Fed has still got interest rates at zero from the last recession. We're, I think we're going to go through an entire business cycle where we go to the next recession, and the Fed hasn't even lifted interest rates from zero, and they're going to have to do QE4. But, look, Ron, you're a big fan of the Fed now. Were you a fan of the Fed in 1999-2000? Did you believe in the new era and the dot-com bubble? Were you a fan of the no. Fed in 2007 well, as they were inflating the housing bubble? Because they're responsible for both those bubbles and the aftermath when they burst. Well, I mean, I think that's a pretty simplistic explanation of what took place in both those periods. I mean, I think if you go back, you, you, certainly uh, credit was both cheap and available in, in those two periods. But um, it was the availability of capital and the availability of credit 
that it helped to inflate the boom. It was not just a function of Fed policy. I mean, if you go back to... So where do you think the, the doc- cheap money came well, from? Well, Peter, I mean, if I can't answer the question, I can't... <laughs> I need to answer the question. If you want to ask me a historical question, then, I mean, it does require a certain amount of time to explain. Um, if you go back to the dot-com boom, in which, yes, the Fed... And the Fed was easy in, in certain circumstances for a variety of reasons. I mean, we did go through a, a couple of periods where we had... Uh, the Asian currency crisis, the the Russian debt default, and the collapse of long term capital, which extended the Fed's easy money cycle beyond their intentions. They were going to raise interest rates in 1997. Which was well, the I, we mistake. don't know that. I mean, but the, the availability of equity capital, not just debt capital and their debt, um, was 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 quite profound in the 1990s, and you had a radical transformation of the technology environment that led to a bubble. It was not just it was not just Fed policy that created the dot com bubble. You cannot, you can't say that retail investors grew so enamored of internet stocks because interest rates were were low. They grew enamored. But it of facilitated it, Ron. Without without all it the extra you. money printing, it and especially you. going into Y two K. I mean, that was a yeah. But you know what? They, they, they drank the that liquidity in two thousand, and, and and you know that was a they printed fifty billion dollars in extra capital, which you know, there were legitimate fears about computer-related glitches going into the year 2000. Going to 07 and 08, yes, they held interest rates down uh, too long, but again, it was the availability of credit. It was the introduction of uh, a rather, um, <laughs> let's say, uh, irresponsible lending standards at the banking and uh, Right, but the Fed, Ron, not only did the Fed make that possible, the teaser rates were all a result of the 1% Fed funds, but then yeah, you had yeah, I get that part, but that's not... You can't Alan reduce Green- it to a single variable. If you go back and look at the actual history of this, in which there was a stated political goal to enhance home ownership to levels we had not seen before, that was separate. And it was an effort. But that was the Fed was participating. In the, the Fed was trying to help with achieve that goal. And yeah, I agree. I agree with you on that. And then listen. And Alan Greenspan believed that we couldn't have a house, a national housing bubble. And from the conversations I had with him off the record in the old days, which I'm now free to talk about. Um, he thought that, wrongly, national banking and the advent of derivatives were diversifiers of risk. My argument was that they were transmission wires of risk, and, and, and the latter argument proved to be right. Having said that, once we approached the precipice of a extraordinary financial calamity, and if you listen to Mervyn King, who was the head of the Bank of England in 2007-8-9, he said we were within three hours of global systemic financial collapse in, at, at the very depths of the crisis. So the yeah. Fed... Ultimately, we, whether we, it was we responsible mellowed, or not you know, responsible. We, we, well, they lit the fire. Now you're telling me they, they put it out. But, you know, I, I think what they did just postponed the day of reckoning to another day. I mean, and well, I, I, don't, I, don't, look, I mean, we had a day of reckoning. I mean, bank stocks were down 90 percent. They were almost nationalized by the yeah, federal but they government. Didn't go, they didn't go down 100 percent, and many of them should have gone down 100 well, percent. The Fed came in and prevented that from happening. But, you know, Ron, I'm not just Monday morning quarterbacking it. For, for in 2004, I, I know, I, I know you I called was, it, Peter. And I, I was specific because I was I making warning. Yeah, because I understood what the Fed was doing and the problems it was creating. And all I'm saying now is that the actions that they took in the aftermath of the problem they created are basically going to come back to bite us when this bubble bursts. The bubble that they used to cover up the last bubble, this one is the biggest. I think the disconnect between reality and, and perception is greater now than it was in 2008. I think the Fed has put us in a situation where they are going to destroy the dollar, even though it's rising right now, when they can't raise interest rates ever. Right? And people figure this out. That's the end of the game. Well, I mean, I, I, and I, I, I disagree wholeheartedly, as, as you know. I mean, I think if we go through... Um, the notion that the stock market, for instance, is on a, a sugar high or a crack high or whatever you want to call it that's been funded by the Fed. Uh, let, let's let's disaggregate some of the realities about the stock market. So in addition to low interest rates, S&P is up 212% from its March 9th bottom. Corporate profits are up 200% since that period. Uh, we also have corporate cash at $4 trillion and the cleanest balance sheets since the 1950s for corporate America. When we look at... Um, other factors that have been uh, capital based for American banking is considerably stronger than it was in 2007 and 2008, 2009. Well, wait, wait, one uh, point about. Well, well, hold on, Peter, Peter. No, no, don't, Peter. You know, you, hey, hey, this can't be a senatorial, you know, uh, attempt to keep me from talking. Let, let me finish my talking. statement. I'm, I'm letting. To, you, all right, yes. I, I'm, I'll let me. I let you finish yours. Okay. So look. So 
if, if, if the stock market were entirely floating on air, I, I would agree if and only if some of these other supportive factors, GDP at a new all-time high, car sales at a new all-time high, retail sales at a new all-time high, uh, corporate profits at uh, record levels, corporate profit margins at record levels, uh, exports, even though they may be called into question this year, at record levels. Um, some of this, obviously, all of this, a great deal of this has been facilitated by Fed policy, particularly in the absence of any proactive countercyclical fiscal policy from a completely dysfunctional White House in Congress, the Fed was the only game in town. So we have come out of the, the, the worst crisis since the 1930s. It does not automatically lead that we go into one in next, because the Fed doesn't have to do QE4. The Fed may just sit and do nothing for a period of time. And, and the U.S. by itself, with assuming the energy boom can continue, manufacturing is coming home, technological innovation is rapid. There are a lot of positives that have absolutely I, nothing to I gotta do with say, the Fed. Let me, let me, i got to say, because you said so many things here, and first of all, the energy boom can't continue unless oil prices go back up. So that, But, but let me go back well, they to need, They need to about. stabilize and move slightly higher, yes. They need to move a lot higher. I'm, inv I'm, I'm invested heavily in the oil sector, and I, I understand the dynamics of what the price has to be. But let me go back to the stock market. You're talking about the record cash. Well, a lot of that cash was borrowed. I mean, corporations have record amounts of debt. And if it wasn't for the Fed keeping interest rates so low, this debt burden would be enormous. Meanwhile, if you look at this year, 2014, about 97, 98 percent, I forget the exact percentage, but of corporate earnings were used to buy back shares and or pay dividends. If you look at the age of corporate plant equipment in America, it's the oldest it's been in 65 years. U.S. companies have years, been turned, yeah. it's been turned into, U.S. companies have been turned into gigantic hedge funds. You know, all, these earnings are all manufactured with share buybacks and debt. If we had a normal cost of capital, if the Fed raised interest rates, stocks would implode along with their earnings because a lot of the revenues would dry up. You're talking about car sales. We have got a subprime boom in auto lending where the federal government is basically doing direct lending through its you know, subsidiaries to all these auto companies so that anybody who can fog a mirror can buy a car with a loan that looks like a mortgage. Uh, we've got a lot of people upside down in their car loans, so this is another credit bubble. You're talking about consumer spending. The savings rate just hit a new low for the year. You talk about our trade deficit. We just had the highest trade deficit ever in manufactured goods. Our, our, our real economy is... When is, did that happen? Manufacturing the trade week, deficit is less yeah, than 3% no, no. of GDP. No, the manufacturing, the last trade deficit we got, we had the largest trade deficit in manufactured goods in the history of the United States. So our, our, the, the, the real manufacturing, our real economy is not strong. It's weak. It's being propped up on a sea of liquidity. Yes, consumers are spending borrowed money. But I don't think these holiday sales, we had a horrible uh, Thanksgiving four-day weekend. We had a really bad uh, Super Saturday. We have a 5% drop in movie box office this year. In fact, among young well, people, the movies, were bad. Down, <laughs> the movies aren't bad. Among young people... Box office is down 15% because they can't afford to buy the tickets. That is the problem. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen, I mean, okay, okay. Let's, let, let's, let's try to deal with, with some of these things that, that have, you know, uh, causes that are not directly related uh, to low interest rates and false asset price, you know, inflation. So, okay, movies. If, if you look at what's happening with um, technology and young people and what millennials are doing and what they're watching and how they are watching it. And this is a twofold problem for the movie industry and for the television industry as well, the traditional television industry, which includes both broadcast and cable, something I do know a little bit about. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the downloading of programs, binge watching of television series, the, um, the distractions that come with the likes of Instagram. And I have three kids who are ages. Yeah, uh, but I mean, look, this has been going on. Look, well, Peter, let me finish the sentence for God's sake. Peter, let me just, Jesus, we do this on CNBC all the time. We have much more time here so we both can talk. So if I can finish the sentence, it would be helpful to the people who are listening. So, yes, yes, television disrupted the movie business for a period of time. Then the movie business had a renaissance, even after television became the principal vehicle by which people entertained themselves at home. Movies have had good years and bad years. This year was not a great year for the movie business for a variety of different reasons and nothing to do with asset prices or ticket prices. It has much more to do with changing viewership habits. And if you look at television ratings, they've been impacted by uh, the advent of being able to download television programs and binge watch. So, <laughs> excuse me, if you were behind on Orange is the New Black, 
you just watch four seasons and you bypassed other programs that you might have otherwise uh, consumed. We our, our habits with respect to media consumption are changing so dramatically um, that, that and in fact, prices for a lot of different products are falling, not rising. Um, and, and, and kids aren't necessarily not going to the movies because they can't afford them. I mean, Transformers did fine, <laughs> as did a variety of other films. There are a lot of films that just weren't that great. So I, 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 you can't blame everything on asset bubbles and ticket prices. And, well, no, no, and, and, it's not and the, the asset like. bubbles that, that are responsible for that. It's by, by diverting capital to the financial sector, by keeping interest rates artificially low to prop up uh, speculation in Wall Street, the, the Federal Reserve diverts capital away from Main Street, from real capital investment, from real you know, productive capacity that would employ people. And so the, the, the counter effect of all this QE is we have a, a, a recovery where re- real, real wages are falling, where the net worth of the average American is declining, where people have lost their full-time jobs, they have part-time jobs, where people who don't even want part-time jobs, who used to be retired, are forced to take a part-time job because that's the only way they can pay their electric bills, and younger people who want full-time jobs can't get any jobs. Uh, because there are none, and the young people that want part-time jobs, they can't get those because their grandparents have the part-time jobs, so they're still living with their parents. They don't have any extra spending money. If they went to college, they've got a liberal arts degree that's worthless, and they have thirty to $50,000 worth of debt hanging over their heads. The problem is we have the Fed micromanaging this economy and blowing these bubbles. If we had real interest rates, if we had a smaller government, we would have a more vibrant economy. But we're not having that because of the Fed. Well, it, the, the government, the size of government, actually, is an interesting question because government employment has actually uh, contracted uh, recently. The size of the budget deficit has gone from 1.4 trillion to 500 billion, and is on its way to less than, and it has already less than three percent of GDP in terms of the deficit. Government employment, uh, I read recently, is now, uh, as a percentage of the economy, uh, the lowest it's been since the 1960s. So, I mean, you can there there are a lot of ways to just throw superlatives out that say. Everything is horrible and everything is false, and, and, and you could say that at any point in history, well, um, and, and, and you can, and, and people often do, and they then uh, miss out on opportunities. It, it, the notion that there's no plant and equipment uh, spending in the United States is false. $116 billion worth of new plant and qu- equipment being put in place right now, 62% of which is foreign direct investment. It's so coming so to take advantage of, that was of lower energy in prices. A, in, in, the, in the energy sector, based on higher <laughs> energy prices, but Somewhat, you well, talk about... Right. No, 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 no. Some about... was based on lower. Some was some was based on lower energy prices. Yeah. If you look at a BASF in Germany building a gas plant in the United States, they are taking advantage of very inexpensive natural gas, yeah. but which I, is a I boom wanted... in the manufacturing sector. And in addition, I would love to see energy prices stabilized so that we can continue yeah, uh, just, developing uh, uh, and fracking. And and I would also uh, point out that that there are aspects of the real economy. Uh, that are doing quite well, and in fact, manufacturing is indeed coming back in the United States, well, and it's not anecdotal. If, if Ron, so if we had to deal with the real rate of interest, you, it, 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 you'd be seeing a, a different tune. But when you talk about the size of the government, um, yes, you say, well, the, the the budget deficit is down to only five or six hundred billion. A, that's still a huge number, but B. During the last year, where the supposed deficit was five or six hundred billion, the national debt still rose by over a trillion. So there's a lot of borrowing going on that's not officially a part of the budget, but we still have to pay for it. The national debt is still rising to reflect uh, how much the government is really spending, not what they're pretending that they're spending. But the other part about it is interest rates. The government now has an $18 trillion national debt. This is just the tip of the iceberg, though. The, the, the bonded debt doesn't count all the other stuff like Fannie and Freddie and student loans that are going to go bad and all this other stuff that we got. But just that $18 trillion, uh, if right now it's financed at such a low rate, we're spending less than $250 billion a year in net interest payments, which is less than we spent on interest when Ronald Reagan was president. But if interest rates just went to 5%, which historically would still be on the low side, uh, you know, since the Second World War, you know, we'd be spending uh, over a trillion dollars a year on interest on the national debt. Now, where's the government going to get an extra $750 billion a year to make interest payments? And if we actually had a currency crisis like they're having in Russia right now, and interest rates had to go to 17%, which is something that happened in the U.S. in, in 1980, they went to 17 20%. You know, what would happen in the United States if we had to pay interest rates like that on the enormity of our sovereign debt? 
Well, <laughs> well uh, and I mean, I think the, the answer is fairly obvious. I mean, the, the question is, is that a possibility, a probability, or a reality? And I think it's a low probability event. If you look at um, well, what's you happening... Ever, you ever hear the, Murphy's well, Law? Gee, Peter, Peter, please. Right. You ever please, hear just let law? me... Yeah, I know what Murphy's Law is. Everybody right. knows what Murphy's okay. Law is. But, okay. I mean, you well, know, but, but, but I can't... If, <laughs> yes, we've all heard of Murphy's Law. We've heard of a lot of different laws. We've heard of the law of gravity. I mean, we've heard of the law of physics, you know, the various laws of physics, the first law of thermodynamics. But if, if you're going to throw out this notion that we may at some juncture have a currency crash and interest rates go to 17% for whatever ungodly reason, let's look at what's actually happening in the world and the flow of funds. So $134 billion has left Russia, which is more than 5% of its GDP, making its way into the United Kingdom, the United States, into uh, of various uh, assets, uh, particularly in the U.S., where Chinese money, Russian money, Latin American money, and Europe money is coming, which is another reason, by the way, by the way, why interest rates are lower than they would otherwise be. Uh, the dollar is stronger, had its best year in decades in 2014, because the United States has become the safe haven, or in my estimation, Fortress America has become the safe haven of the world. We have the things That's the perception. that every other... Well, no, it's not the perception, it's yeah. the reality. This no, is, well, this people is one thought way. the U.S. was a safe haven 19, in 1998, 1999. The dollar was stronger than it is today. The dollar index went up to 120 because people were so enamored by the new economy and the dot-coms, but then the dollar collapsed for the ensuing eight years. So people have a tendency of getting on the wrong side of the boat at the same time because a lot, well, the, a well, lot more first people of all, the think dollar... like you than think like me. You know? So the people that think like well, you... Well, no, I said... Uh, thing, no, you know? I... No, no, no. I don't do any of the same things as anybody else. I mean, I don't even think you have any idea what I do. Um, so, with respect to, uh, um, <laughs> say, let me hop in here for one that. second, guys. Let me. <laughs> yeah, let, feel free. It would yeah, be yeah, yeah. Let me hop in here for one second. In. We are on the line with Peter Schiff, CEO. CEO and Chief Global Strategist at Euro Pacific Capital, as well as Ron Ansana, and he's a CNBC contributor and author of Insana's Market Intelligence. Guys, I want to see if I can get you to agree on something. And my question is... <laughs> the, here, here, it's Friday. There, there you go. Here's my, here, okay. We no, we can do better that. than that, Ron. No, uh, the Fed is focusing right now on unemployment, inflation, certain production factors, and we all know that the factors that the Fed focuses on changes, you know, over the course of time. Uh, Ron, I'll go to you first. Is is the Fed focusing on the right economic factors? And if they change, is the Fed capable of adapting? Well, I mean, the Fed's ability to adapt in the sense that its its mandate changes is, is entirely a, a part of a, a legislative constraint. I mean, the Fed, by by mandate from Congress, has to focus on um, maximum sustainable employment and price stability. Now, in, if you go back to the Volcker era to which Peter alluded earlier, when interest rates were at uh, 20.5%, they were fighting inflation that was in the double digits in the United States and unemployment that was in the double digits, and interest rates were risen uh, were, were raised to, to, to a level that would, would counteract and beat back uh, the threat of inflation in the Volcker regime. Now, the Fed's focus on price stability today uh, since 2008, 2009, has been on preventing deflation from taking hold in the United States. That is the, in, in, in many ways, we're in the exact opposite uh, period that, that Volcker, in which Paul Volcker presided over the Fed. So, by by mandate, by legislation, by 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 law, the Fed focuses on those two areas while taking into account other uh, uh, variables that could affect employment or price stability. So, they they cannot just pivot and say all of a sudden. Um, okay, now we are going to focus on uh, industrial production purely, or, or we're going to fo- focus on uh, the price of movie tickets. There are variables you know, uh, that, that weigh into employment and price stability, but, but if they depart, and, and, and one would argue that they might have, although I don't necessarily agree with the argument, that if they depart from that mandate, uh, then they have to answer, and, and particularly now with the fully GOP Congress, they're going to have probably see more questions about their policies than they have in the past. Peter, I know well, where you're going with this. Go ahead. Well, first of all, you know, I think that if you're looking at inflation, if you're going back to you know the days when the Fed was theoretically fighting inflation instead of trying to create it, um, you know, we we certainly measured the effect of inflation differently back then. Uh, you know, when Nixon first imposed wage and price controls, which was a ridiculous effort. But it was when inflation, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, was 4%. Uh, 
Um, and, and so now the way we measure inflation, it's, you know, one and a half percentage or something like that. But we're not measuring it the same way. If we measured it using the exact same methodology that they were using when Nixon was president, we probably would have a CPI that was rising faster than 4%. So, you know, the, the Fed is just, you know, uh, uh, playing this game. You know, they talk about price stability. Well, the definition of stability is prices that are stable. Well, the Fed doesn't want price stability. I mean, if they wanted price stability, they would want to have a lower inflation rate than the one we have right now because prices are rising, even at a rate that you know, I believe they're rising faster than what the CPI shows, but at least the CPI shows in prices going up. But the Fed says they want prices to go up faster in the name of stability. Well, if prices are going up every year, they're not stable. So the Fed doesn't really have a goal of price stability anymore. The Fed's goal is inflation, and that's the one thing that they're going to achieve because they can't achieve their other goal of maximizing employment because monetary policy can't create jobs. But you have a bunch of Keynesians who believe that if you just print enough money or keep interest rates low enough, that somehow that's going to lead to employment, and it's not going to happen. I mean, the only thing it does is reduce the value of wages, and that is what is happening. And if you look at real wages in the United States, uh, they are falling. And I think it's a direct consequence of Fed monetary policy. It's not the only thing. You have regulatory policy and tax policy that also undermines productivity, but you have the Fed undermining the value of, of money uh, through, you know, through you know, quantitative easing or m monetizing government debt. So I think what, what we really should have is a Federal Reserve that just supplies sound money. But I think in the political environment that we're in, since we went off the gold standard, that is impossible. I know Ron said you had a lot of private conversations with, with Alan Greenspan, and I know Alan Greenspan is a proponent of the gold standard. And, in fact, when he was... Not really. Well, when, when he was uh, Fed chairman, he thought that maybe the central bankers um, had, had, you know, had replaced gold but he regrets that now. I mean, I, I don't know if you the last time you talked to him. I was at a conference we were both speaking at in New Orleans uh, just a few months ago, and he was very critical of the Fed, very critical of QE, and his advice to the audience was to buy gold uh, because he says that the Fed has created a huge problem and it's not going to end well. And, you know, I think well, that, you know, he's, he's yeah. coming clean now as he's getting closer to death. Ron, guys, we, listen, guys, yeah. we got to wrap this up here. But like okay. the, the goal of our show is that you know help not not only traders but investors navigate the markets. And you guys both have really have a lot of great points and good ideas. Just if you in, in thirty seconds, Ron, we'll start with you for just the average investor. What advice do you have for them in two thousand fifteen? Well, I, you know, I do think that this is a simpler proposition than most people realize. I mean, I, I would still be, uh, I would still have exposure to equities. I would still um, own, if, if you can do nothing else, I would own 50% a, a of your portfolio in, in the S&P Spider, which is an ETF that reflects where the market is going. And I would balance that off with some bond exposure. I, I'm not a commodity fan. I'm not a gold bug, so I don't think it really has a place in an individual's portfolio. Um, but the, the, besides that, um, a dollar, and, and this is you know purely a personal finance stuff for people who do not have any experience in investing. You know your dollar cost average. You don't just put all your money into the stock market today. You spread it out over the course of a year, and then net net those things tend to work out. The market, by the way, goes up on uh, about seventy to eighty percent of the time over the course of history. So yes, you'll endure volatility, maybe even a collapse. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you look down 20 or 30 years, uh, you're going to be in pretty good shape having exposure to equities. I would, I don't like passive investing and just buying ETFs. Um, I would be more active. It's something we talk about in the newsletter. But, you know, net, net, I, I think we're in a secular bull market that's not going to end. We may have an interruption this year, but I don't think it's going to end for several years to come. And Peter? Well, you know, Ron finally said something that I can agree with, and that I believe we have a bit of a bubble in passive investment. And I think a lot of people are, are discounting uh, the value of uh, stock selection and just instead of just buying everything and hoping that it keeps going up. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, that's what investors are making the mistake of doing. I mean, we had a, I think we have a record amount of hedge funds or since 2008 closing this year because active managers are not beating uh, the the indexes because I think they're 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 too you know if, if you're smart you can't just buy this market because you have to understand the problems that are there but if you think you underperform in a, in, a, in an environment like this and so I think a lot of investors who are chasing these indexes uh, are going to lose a lot of money uh, when the market turns 
Also, I think I agree, you know, bonds, I don't see the risk rewarded bonds. Yes, they keep going up, but I think there's so much risk uh, beneath the market in the bond market for such a little reward. Uh, yeah, I guess if you're all levered up and trading them, maybe there's money to be made if you think you can get out in time. But for a typical investor, I just don't see the reason to have any exposure uh, to to the bond market. Uh, so I would prefer stocks. But again, you've got to be careful in the stocks that you buy. And Ron is right. Over time, stock prices do go up, but so does the price of everything, you know, uh, because the value of money keeps going down. At least that's been the case since the Fed was created 100 years ago. Prior to that, you know, prices went down all the time, and that was a good thing. But now the price of everything goes up because the value of money keeps going down. And so as an investor, you have to get rid of your money before it loses value, especially now when you have the central bank promising that if you hold on to dollars, they will lose value because that is their mission, to destroy the value of your money. So you've got to do something with it. So, yes, I believe that people should look at assets like stocks. Personally, I think that there are much better values in a lot of these international markets that I'm focused in, uh, that as Ron pointed out, you know, the European market didn't do much in the last year. In fact, if you measure it in dollars, it did really poorly. In fact, there are very few markets in 2014 that beat the price of gold. I mean, gold outperformed almost every market in, in the world. The U.S. is one of the few markets that, that beat gold, but most didn't. Um, and, and so I think that people should uh, be looking for value, looking for dividends abroad in currencies that I think will ultimately appreciate. And I do think that people should own gold. I think it's proven to be a good store of value. And if you're not sure what you want to do, if you're not sure how much exposure you want to have in stocks, I think that keeping your liquidity in gold makes a lot more sense than keeping it in dollars or euros or yen or any other fiat currencies that are just being uh, printed. I cannot find a better way to end this segment than you t- you two guys agreeing on something. Thank you so much. <laughs> Peter Schiff, CEO and Chief Global Strategist at Europe Pacific Capital, as well as Ron Insana, frequent CNBC contributor and author of Insana's Market Intelligence on Market Five. Gentlemen, thanks so much. I enjoyed that. I'm sure our listeners did. And you know what? We're going to get you guys back on again soon. Anytime you like. Happy New Year. Okay. All right. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Ron.